for the city council study session on district systems, uh, specifically referring to the downtown West and Google project. Uh, and before we begin, Tony, could you please call roll? Menes? Perales? Cohen? Carrasco? Maybe Tony, why don't we t take a moment? Uh, Sounds like folks still need to join on. Why don't we give it a minute or two? <laughs> Feels like you're striking out right now. So. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to resend um, invites to just in case. Okay, great. Yeah, we'll just give it a minute to get everybody on. So I just got a text from Councilmember Sparza that says Councilmember Cohen is with her. So I know he. Do you want him to say he's here? Yeah. He's here. Carrasco's here. I just, Perales just came in as an attendee, so I'm moving him over. I think I can try again. Okay, great. Okay, Jimenez. Morales? I'm here now, thank you. Cohen is here. here. Roscoe? Here. Davis? Davis? Here. Esparza? Here. Arenas? Foley? Here. Mahan? Here. Jones? Present. Licardo? Present. You have thank a Thank you, Tony. All right, thanks, Tony. Uh, okay, then. Uh, uh, Dave or Nancy, did you want to take it away? Yeah, thanks, Mayor. I uh, just appreciate the opportunity today. Uh, this is a, an information session and uh, looking forward to presenting the material. I'm just going to turn it over to Nancy. Thank you very much, Dave. And Tara will, will put up the presentation for us in just a second. While she's doing that, Mayor and Council, uh, Nancy Klein, Office of Economic Development, I want to thank you for setting aside this time to review the district systems proposal that's a key component of the district downtown West project. And I'm joined today by several people, Bill Eckern from Office of Economic Development, who's project manager from OED. Carrie Romanow, who's the Director of Environmental Services, Matt Kano, who's Director of Public Works, Lori Mitchell, who's the Director of San Jose Clean en Energy, and available to answer questions is Alexa Reyna, who's the Director of Development for Google, and some Paul Dunn, as you see, who works with her. Um, I do want to just mention that the study session is designed to provide an overview of the district systems, generally where they are in the proposed development, and how they support environmental objectives, not only of the project, but of the city as well. The city of San Jose, as you know, has taken a strong leadership position on climate action and sustainability. We have ambitious policies and guidance, and they are these policies are set out in the general plan, <clears throat> Climate Smart San Jose plan, and San Jose Reach Code, just to name a few. Tara, please go on. We regularly share the code of conduct for public meetings. And at the end, should anyone want to speak, please raise your hand. You can also submit electronic comments to Lori Severino at the um, uh, email below. Next. This is uh, a, a Zoom meeting link and a phone number for the pro for the conversation as well. Next one, Tara. Wait, can we go? This is Tony, the city clerk. Can we go back to that slide? Mm -hmm. The meeting link at the top, the 951-890-84728 is the correct meeting ID. The webinar at the bottom is incorrect. So anybody who's calling in, 
um, please use 951-890-84728. Thank you. Tony, thank you so much. Tara, next slide, please. So for today, we, we'll get through some additional introductory comments and we'll spend a bulk of time going over the systems approach uh, and its integration into the Downtown West Development Project. And then um, staff is eager to hear questions and feedback from council before going to public comments. And next slide here. So, what we'll be working through more specifically is what is a district system and why are we and Google pursuing district systems? A district system is at this point an emerging approach that is going on throughout the world to assure that projects can meet the expectations of tenants, owners, and cities to be environmentally sound. District systems are a more efficient way to support buildings on site and the systems themselves are connected to citywide systems. District systems can be described as taking the back of the house systems like heating and cooling and electric and wastewater and more systems that every building normally has and instead centralizing them and consolidating them into a central utility plant that serves the district. This again can save space, for example, leaving room, uh, if you go back to the last one, please, um, leaving room on roofs for solar, et cetera, that otherwise would have um, mechanical systems on the top of their buildings. The district systems approach works in tandem with existing networks, limiting the stress on city or other agency systems by operating more efficiently. The systems add more redundancy and capacity and are more resilient. District systems have the ability to island from the broader grid in the event of a power outage. If the broader grid shuts down, the backup power will be provided from the downtown west power systems. Now, next slide. And then what systems are proposed? And you see here, we're gonna talk a little bit about utility corridors or utilidors and electrical systems, wastewater, building, heating and cooling, et cetera. Google's plans include the ability to construct an integrative program of systems that are installed in a private conduit called a utilidor, which is also not solely on public property, but on private property. The systems planned for construction within the utilidor are electric distribution, wastewater, recycled water, and infrastructure and for heating and cooling of buildings. Next slide. And how, how can a, dis, a district system be implemented? The city will develop or is in the process of developing conditions of approval that will set out specific ways that the systems can be operated <clears throat> and implemented. And you will hear more about conditions of approval as we move forward in the presentation. Next slide. The MOU that Google and the city executed in December of 2018 memorialized the aspiration for the project to achieve a very high level of en environmental sustainability. Above, you see excerpts from the MOU that speak to environmental sustainability and the development of district systems goals. The Downtown West project was certified <clears throat> as an AB 900 project consistent with the state AB 900 program. AB 900 requires outstanding environmental principles and practices to be built into the project. The Downtown West program as proposed achieves and goes beyond what is identified through the AB 900 program. And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Bill Eckert. Thank you, Nancy. Um, Tara, go ahead and click ahead. Mr. Mayor, City Council, it's a pleasure to be here. 
and talk to you about the district systems approach that Downtown West is proposing. Okay. As Nancy uh, alluded, uh, the program that uh, Google is proposing aligns with uh, several of the programs and policies that the city has in place, uh, beginning at the top of the hierarchy with the general plan. Um, the goal is to continue to be a, a major contributor to the city's um, ultimate goals of meeting these uh, environmental um, platforms and ideals. Same thing as you move down through the Climate Smart and the various master plans, the programs and the uh, construction that Google is proposing are intended to help the city meet these and, and stay consistent with its master plans and very much consistent with the city's new REACH program with all electric buildings Google proposes and entirely electric uh, build office buildings and other facilities. Okay. Again, as Nancy alluded though, I think one of the keys that um, has people excited about the district systems approach is that it allows you to consolidate what goes in individual buildings into a central plant, uh, making the oppor opportunities and the uh, operations of the individual buildings more efficient. You're able to balance electrical use and water use and other things that power buildings and go through the different buildings in a manner that is controllable. So you can pick off the highs and lows uh, and be just much more efficient in the way you operate the buildings and, and they operate the overall systems and consequently affect the environmental, the environment much more positively. Okay. This is just a graphic showing the, the way buildings in, interrelate with the central utility plant. Um, I think it's important because I don't have a better graphic that I haven't installed one about what a central utility plant would look like. But one of the conversations that we've had with Google and of their interest is to make everything that is environmentally beneficial in their project educational at the same time. And so there are aspirations that the central plant becomes an educational center as well that uh, the public and, and others can use to understand and see the systems operationally and uh, get a better sense for how they uh, integrate with the buildings and also integrate with the city's programs and the city's infrastructure. Again, to Nancy's earlier point, one of the things that being pulling the um, infrastructure off of the roofs of the buildings, the heating and cooling systems and others, allows you to put uh, solar panels and other, other things, even green roofs, on the buildings and not be competing with the, the operational needs of an individual building. They've identified, we've identified in this slide as well, some of the ideals that Google is looking to accomplish with their utilities, which is the heating and cooling systems, the power, uh, microgrid electrical system, and the reuse of the water system. At this point, although it shows on the slide, we're not looking to deal with the solid waste programs uh, um, under their current proposals. Okay. Again, to Nancy's point, the, a key issue and a key point to take away is that uh, Google's 80 acres, although they have the ability to stand alone, are intimately connected into the city and other municipal systems. They connect to the San Jose Water Company supply in order to pr provide water to their, to their site. They, uh, that water is processed through and some portion of that then is discharged after they treat what they need for on-site recycled water. They discharge the, the, the remaining wastewater and, and solids in, back into the city system for processing at the city's uh, and the regional plant. And then finally, uh, the microgrid is powered through the transmission lines from PG&E so that they are connected into the, into the overall grid, but with the opportunity as a system, and we'll talk about it further, to isolate itself should the exterior grid break down that they can maintain operations within their buildings and provide power for the offices and residents. Okay. Um, one of the systems that they're looking to uh, be able to take advantage of in a district program is the thermal heating and cooling for the different buildings. And this is a uh, essentially a very maturing uh, 
um, industry at this point in time. It's common throughout the world. These are several examples of projects um, around the world in which on-site heating and cooling and central distribution to the to the programs and the offices and residents within these areas are taken care of. Um, I think it's critical coming close to home that a couple of projects that Google also is working on are their Bayview project in, Mount, in Mountain View and another office project in Sunnyvale. And I, again, it's important that there, these systems are beginning to be in, more familiar in California. Many uh, university campuses throughout the state and the country have um, these sorts of systems, Stanford being a notable example of that. The, the key again here is that this is a, a relatively mature system that's still progressing technologically. So we should see ongoing advancements even in the, the Downtown West project as it comes online, okay? Uh, the opportunity to deal with water on a district level is also very important. Again, this is something that is being done throughout the world. Uh, the technology is coming online. And again, as I said earlier, it's a, an evolving technology. This even more so than the heating and cooling. I would expect to see pretty rapid growth in implementation as well as opportunities for technological advances for the use of various types of water in these, in these districts. Okay. The utilidors or the utility corridors um, are a major component for the distribution of these um, opportunities, these utilities throughout the system. And as you can see, by it's very difficult to see at this scale, perhaps, but the black line that extends from north to south throughout the, the 80 acres is gives you a sense of scale for. The, and, and ambition for distributing these systems throughout all of the properties within the 80 acres. It not only moves across uh, a, a number of streets, but it also is anticipated that it will cross the creeks and other things in order to distribute to all of the offices and with the potential for connection to the affordable housing projects and, and other residential projects, depending on when they come online vis-a-vis -vis the, the scale of the, the overall infrastructure system, okay? The next, the next slide, this is just an example of the scale and the types of utilities, how they might be arranged within one of these utilidors. And just to be clear, this, these are not small structures. These are roughly 20 foot by 20 foot concrete structures placed well under the existing infrastructure in the streets so that they are out of the way of the other norm, normative or normal city infrastructure and other public infrastructure uh, throughout this area. Okay. The, probably the most unique piece of the discussions and, and opportunities within this uh, Downtown West project is the distribution of electricity through a microgrid. These are not very common yet really in California. They're beginning to gain a lot of traction throughout the world. People are beginning to try a, a whole range of novel approaches to um, providing electricity and assuring the ability of their programs and tenants to stay operable when there are failures in the broader system. The three options that Google and the city are exploring at the moment one is to have the city of San Jose become a municipal electrical provider and provide, be the owner and operator of the, of the microgrid itself. The, the PG&E has that at this point in time, the ability to do this. It's, and Google has begun discussions with, with uh, PG&E for the, uh, to, to develop a microgrid that PG&E could be the owner and operator of. I would jump up back up to the San Jose piece just to note that Google has worked is working with the city as we move forward with the exploration of the potential for a city operating system. And uh, Lori Mitchell and her uh, uh, crew will be back to you at some time in the future to talk about the status of, of their studies and what it takes for us to keep moving forward as a city. And then finally, the, the last option, and it's not the preferred option by any of us, um, but it does would allow for Google um, to be the owner and operator of this system. Um, and uh, 
go forward from that perspective. There's some we're continuing to work with Google and on the on the various steps that that might take in order to become the the course go, going forward. The most critical piece um, of all of these is the understanding that Google, as any developer building infrastructure for its use and for public use, would build out these systems under any one of these three scenarios. The question or the the at the end of the day, it's a question of who owns it and is responsible for the operation of the of the facilities um, rather than who spends the capital dollars to build it out. Okay. This is a the Hudson Yards program in, in Manhattan, New York, is an example of a, an existing microgrid. It's not completely analogous to what we're looking at in California, but it's a good example of how these systems can work and the efficacy of having a, a microgrid system supporting offices and retails. Shortly after this uh, microgrid went online, they had power outages in, in New York City and they were able to, the, op the operators and the owners were able to um, maintain operations by being, by relying on their microgrid system as a way to power up the offices and residents while the, the greater con consolidated Edison system was down and recovering to, through for storms. And uh, I guess the other key piece in this that's worth noting is that the microgrid itself is not owned or operated by the owners of the properties and the development per se, but that it's operated by a separate company that which uh, was formed in order to, to own and manage this facility. Okay. The next couple of slides on the Hudson Yard just talk in a little bit more detail about the capacities for what they have and the types of systems that they have in place in order to um, to, to deliver the, the to deliver the services to their tenants. Next slide. And I, again, uh, they've they've done a rainwater capture system as well that allows them to uh, to operate. And also, the this highlights again that there is a third party operator and manager of the electrical system. Okay. The process for ensuring that the citizens and the residents of San Jose are protected uh, with uh, the district systems. We anticipate taking uh, through the um, uh, entitlement process at, at the same time and in the same manner that we're proposing to take vertical development and other development within the Downtown West project forward, which is that once the overall guidelines and um, approaches are approved, by the city council this spring, that then the individual projects and the individual actions would come back through a process of conformance review that is handled at the staff level with the departments um, making their uh, review and, and, and making sure that conditions and the work is done in a satisfactory manner. So this would be a, a very analogous situation to the overall planning and development program that we're looking at uh, as an innovative way to assure that these projects move forward across the board in downtown West, okay? And the key to the city, and this was, is I think an important part for the operations of the infrastructure itself is that um, we worked with Google to make sure that we as staff were satisfied that there were ways to protect residents and um, tenants in the case that some form or other failure of the systems occurred. And, and so Google has worked with us to propose a series of backstops where the, um, the obligations move, stay with the land. They don't run with the development agreement. They, they continue to stay on the properties. If there was a failure of the microgrid system, if it was privately operated, that the, the obligations for assuring that the project, pro, the, excuse me, the uh, necessary capital projects are developed, that the rates are maintained appropriately for the, for the residents, falls to the owners of the office buildings at, in the future should Google sell the office buildings to someone else. Otherwise, the obligations for making sure that the rates are, are where they appropriately need to be and that the systems are adequately maintained and funded 
uh, would stay with Google. Okay. Next slide. To pick up um, some further discussion about each of the systems, um, we'll uh, eat, pardon me, but uh, the first the first uh, discussion is about wastewater, and so I will turn this over to Carrie Romano. Uh, thanks, Bill. So, um, just for context, just wanted to remind uh, council and the community that you know while we're very supportive of this um, uh, district system. From a wastewater and recycled water perspective, we do have capacity to accept um, the wastes generated from, um, from this development. And then we also would be able to extend our recycled water system into that development, which would then also enable the system, the purple pipe to continue to be extended beyond the system. So um, we're generally good either way. Uh, there's no uh, existing system constraint. You could go to the next slide. Um, from a permitting standpoint, um, we would, you know, because they want to do on-site wastewater, and really that's not something we've taken on before, but there are other municipalities who have already gone down that path. So there are folks we can tap into, and there is an existing framework. So in other words, we know we can do it. Um, there are state wastewater permitting and recycled water standard will just to ensure from a public health, health standpoint that uh, those would apply to this particular uh, mm -hmm. operation. And one of the ways that we've managed that is we've reached agreement with Google that they will fall into our industrial discharge permit. That's something that we require all um, large dischargers to, uh, to comply with. And that lets our city's pretreatment program um, ensure that the waste is adequately treated before it enters the wastewater system and, um, and also has a, you know, a process to provide updates as nutrient levels in the Bay change and if we get more stringent requirements from the state and federal government. So it's a process that's very similar to uh, semiconductor fabs that used to be true for the, um, the other food distributors and uh, manufacturers in the city as well. So it's a standard framework for us. We're very comfortable with that. Um, we would also have, as you might imagine, uh, the new development will use our existing uh, rate framework. We'll probably have to come up with a unique model to cover the recycled water component, but we'll continue to, um, to partner with, with uh, the developer on that. And the sanitary sewer and use charges apply to this facility in the same way they apply to every other resident or business uh, throughout the city. And that's, as you may remember, a requirement of Prop 218 that those, everyone pays for the services uh, that they're getting and that there's no subsidy. Um, we had, as the project has evolved over time, and because we're not familiar with on-site wastewater, we do just want to make sure that there's no odor with wastewater treatment. There's no odor generated from the facility. So we'll ensure that the project mitigates that and that there's some checks and balances along the way. Although compliance over time would be regulated by the Bay Area or Quality Management District, we, uh, we would, we're also obviously in, uh, interested in ensuring that the new development does um, does not generate odors and that we're confident of that before startup. Uh, next slide. So as, as part of our oversight, we'll review the permitting details, application of charges, odor controls prior to issuing the building permit uh, and under the conditions of approval. And then we'll just continue to uh, work with that odor mitigation plan and, uh, and ensure that that's met. And with that, I'll turn it over to Lori. Thank you, Carrie. Lori Mitchell, I'm the Director of Community Energy. As Bill mentioned, there's three different options uh, that we are considering on the electric distribution system. The first option is San Jose owned and important to note that in all of these options, the developer would put in the infrastructure. It's just a question of who would be the long-term owner and operator. So we have been studying the initial feasibility of the city owning and operating, and we will come back to council um, to further brief what we found there. But in general, we found that that is feasible, that there may be benefits both in design um, uh, flexibility to enable some of the components of the microgrid, as well as potentially some economic benefits. 
The second option is, is really the status quo, although there is a new microgrid enablement program that Google is working on with PG&E where they would be the long-term owner and operator of the distribution system. And then the third option is privately operated. And so that is a scenario where Google would own and operate. So next slide. So in terms of future considerations, important to note that we will come back to council and the city provided service. There's a number of actions council would need to take in order to enable this option formation of the utility. And it's important to note, we are looking at just this development, not the rest of the city, um, but that would require future action and approval, um, future action to interconnect to PG&E's transmission system that also would be required in, in all cases. Um, and then of course, a business relationship with Google for the microgrid implementation and operation. In terms of Google provided service, uh, there are additional future considerations, including Google's currently exploring alternatives to CPUC current regulations. Um, the franchise or, or another appropriate mechanism would have to be considered and then required permitting details and compliance with the conditions of approval. So next slide. I think I'm going to turn it over to Matt Kano here. Thank you, Lori. Matt Kano, Director of Public Works. Um, and Bill already talked about the Utilidor. Um, and in order to allow the Utilidor, um, we need to go through the city's encroachment permit process. Um, the um, a lot of the locations where the utilidor would be or would be crossing would be within the public right of way. Um, and um, that is held in the public trust. Um, there is a section in the municipal code 13.37 that we use to evaluate and issue um, major and minor encroachment permits um, for projects like this. Next slide. So um, what is a revocable encroachment permit? So encroachment permits, because they are um, within the public right of way, um, need to be revocable. Um, and that means the city, um, if the city ever had um, uh, a different use for that site, um, that revocability clause would kick in. Um, the permit also does um, allow for um, work to compl be completed to um, the standards um, by issuing a permit um, that are safe for the public and maintain our assets. Um, and it protects the public from responsibility and liability um, because they're, um, of what is being done in our or the operation within our public right of way. Next slide. Um, we have a process, whether it's um, BART uh, or a um, or a small PG&E trench or a major um, utilidor structure like this, which is obviously extremely unique, um, um, and it'll be very exciting and interesting to work on. Um, we have a process where we review and inspect and administer these permits um, and have traffic control procedures and inspections in place um, to make sure it minimizes disrupt the disruption to the public when it's under construction and under use. Next slide, please. And it goes back to Bill, I think, here. I'll Actually, pick it up one for Nancy. Comes back to me. Thank you. Um, I know in a short amount of time, we have packed in a lot of information. So I just wanna highlight a couple of things as you think about what comments or questions you might have. One, that through the entitlement process, there is a checklist and staff delegation to review the conformance, much as we've talked about for the, the Downtown West design guidelines and that the district systems are integrated into each element, including the zoning and infrastructure plan, and in fact, the design guidelines. Part of this will also cover the ownership issue once it's resolved uh, for the microgrid. The checks and balances we've discussed set out a series of priorities on how the systems would be set up and that we'd create criteria for the project so that it performs as we want it to. Checklist items or checks and balances include things like service level, rate equity, safety, capital improvements, operation and ownership, for example. Next slide. Oh, we'll actually go one back, Tara, sorry. What, what, I, what I wanted to conclude with, and then also mention our next steps here, is that 
We are very excited as a city. Um, the intention of the outcomes of the implementation of the project is to deliver a truly innovative complement of systems working to achieve a much higher level system or uh, manner of en environmental sustainability than San Jose has before. Much work has already been done on the proposed systems and much work remains to be done to achieve the ambitious plans before you. Truly, once this becomes a reality, the Downtown West Project will pioneer the next level of urban environmental responsibility, not only for San Jose and the state, but really in terms of the country. The next couple of steps to keep driving toward the reality of the systems are one, as Lori and Bill mentioned, you'll see a review and ask for a council uh, a direction on the city electrical service option. And then the staff will be coming forward with the approvals on the downtown west proposal as a whole and the district systems approvals will be included in those actions at that time. With that, staff is happy to understand what you might be thinking and also to provide you with any additional information. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks, everyone. Um, but certainly very promising in our city. I'm sorry, is there a problem with connection? Yes, we're losing you a little bit, Mayor. Okay, I'll, I'll, you're losing me. Okay, I'll try to switch. LeBron? Me? Just go ahead, Roland. Roland? Is he, um, Henry, is he uh, able to speak? Here we go. Thank you, can, can you hear me now? We can hear you, go ahead. Okay, I, I wasn't getting the MUs. So first of all, um, and I'm not seeing a clock, the first thing I want to make very clear is that I'm personally absolutely opposed with either the city of pg and &E having anything to do with this. This should be designed, operated, and owned by Google and nobody else, end of discussion. But the one thing that I would really like you to consider is to introduce a transportation element into the uh, into the district and i'll get to explain to you what first why and then how the issue that we have right now is that downtown west is directly adjacent to the disc and the disc footprint as currently proposed is encroaching on downtown west we need to resolve this and this is how the solution is to relocate some of the disc elements by integrating these elements into the downtown west underground infrastructure. And there are two elements for your consideration. The first one is the light rail tunnel, the reconnection. How are we gonna be reconnecting the new light rail uh, station to the existing tracks on, on their mass? That's one thing that needs to be part of the, uh, of the district. The other element is the underground station for the airport connector. That has to go under there somewhere. We do have an entrance on Santa Clara, but we need another entrance at the uh, corner of uh, Alton and San Fernando. And these are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, yeah, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I'm, uh, I'm opposed to it for the same reasons that Roland is, but also, we there was a there was a discussion regarding this last February, 
uh, not the February that just passed, the year before that. And what Google is going to try to do is because they're going to be the, they're basically the uh, leaders in quantum computing. And so the, the, gen, the, the amount of power that's going to be necessary in order for them to continue in that quantum mm -hmm. computing, that that's going to be the heart of, Google is right there. Um, they want to have their own conduit into uh, PG&E. They just want to like plug right in. We had a lengthy discussion about that, and it was opposed at that time. So I don't know why now that um, somehow or another it's becoming a better idea. Google has not proven themselves a good neighbor yet. You know, I mm -hmm. honestly, the legacy that I have as a Chicano in this community is worth far more than the billions of dollars that Google is throwing around and, and acting as if they're renaming that space downtown West. They've renamed San Jose Silicon Valley. And, and, and all of this kinds of like naming, thinking that you can throw down your billions of dollars when Google just 22 years ago didn't even exist. It did not even exist. It was an idea in the minds of those two men from Stanford University. That's it. Now, all of a sudden, one generation later, they are exercising this kind of economic power and disruption to the infrastructure when this city itself has not contended with its historical injustices and genocide of the Chicano and the Native American communities. So I would like it if, the, if people on the council would consider that when uh, making the decisions here, because we need some protections. Thank you, uh, Blair. Go ahead. Hi, uh, hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Um, thank you for the words today on this item. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I think we grew up, uh, you know, in the 70s and 80s with, uh, you know, with what could have been a unifying vision that, that's being offered here today. And we made uh, mincemeat of it back then. And we just tore everything apart and, and spliced it all into individual groups uh, vying for how to uh, lay down electric uh, and wire and, and, and telephone wire and, and all the stuff. And, um, you know, I guess we developed a system at work, but now we're, we're considering how, again, how to unify that whole process, which on its whole, I think is awesome. I think it's a great idea. I think, I think what it can do to uh, efficiency and, and, and how government can have a, an important part uh, in the process, uh, it, it's, yeah, it, it just creates a good organizational process. But, you know, there are some really lingering, looming questions about uh, doing this. And so uh, I ask for caution. I ask, you know, to remind yourselves of community energy and its purpose and what it could have worked towards, towards all of this. And the questions as community energy, you know, community can ask. And uh, it can be a more open process of community itself engaging in the future of this stuff. For instance, I don't want nuclear energy traveling through those electric lines in the future. I think we really need to work towards a future that doesn't have to include nuclear. And how do we begin to take those steps? And um, yeah, so that's my two cents. And uh, good luck with this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeffrey? Uh, Mayor and Council, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Jeffrey Buchanan on behalf of Working Partnerships USA and Silicon Valley Rising. Um, appreciate all the uh, uh, tremendous amount of work uh, done by the, the staff and, and Google team and uh, coming up with this uh, set of systems analysis. Uh, certainly, it's it's you know it, it's very clear the the environmental benefits of of pulling these pieces together uh, would encourage uh, the staff uh, to continue to also uh, bring a lens of, of thinking about how do we how do we address the community's concerns. Uh, around this project delivering quality jobs. Um, certainly, uh, we know that power generation and delivery here in, uh, in, in our area uh, involves workers, union workers uh, with, through PG&E who, who have a, a, a very good 
uh, standard of, of pay and benefits and protections. And so how as we look at designing new systems, uh, I would hope that the, the city uh, and Google continue to keep an eye on thinking about how do we maintain quality family supporting jobs uh, as a part of both the, the construction and operations uh, of these systems and, and certainly appreciate the, uh, the engagement to date uh, from the, uh, the Google team on these issues and the conversations with the city, uh, but want to make sure that that continues to be a part of these work plans as we think about improving these systems and uh, doing some of these model type of projects around uh, environmental sustainability uh, that we make sure we're thinking about our working families. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. McKinnon. Uh, Vice Mayor, are you able to hear me now? Loud and clear. Okay, thank you. I keep trying a different uh, uh, connectivity here. Uh, let's go first to uh, Councilmember Mahan. Thanks, Mayor, and thanks to the city staff and Google for all your great work on, on this idea and, and giving us this the background today. I think it's really, really an interesting and innovative idea and seems like it has a lot of potential benefits. Um, so, you know, admire Google for continuing to push the envelope on innovation in, in all ways. And um, I thought Nancy had a nice list of considerations and values at the end of the presentation there of things we need to, to be mindful of. And, and one that I just, you know, want to make sure we're coming back to and, and continually examining is just really thinking through the potential impact on our city run utility systems and any potential long-term impacts on, on rate payers. I guess that's kind of what's at the forefront for me at the moment, I'm super supportive of the sustainability and, and kind of climate benefits here, which is what makes me so excited about this. But um, I, I don't know to what extent city staff can build on what was presented, but I, I am curious if we were to go forward with this district system, do, what do we know at this point about the financial impacts on the utilities that the city currently operates? And obviously, you know, we operate kind of a portion of the energy system and then water waste management. Do, do we have any understanding at this point of, of what the financial implications would be for, for our city owned systems? Terry or Lori would be best to start us off there. Thank you, okay. Council Member. Uh, thanks, Nancy. I'll, I'll start with the water and wastewater. Um, from a water, wastewater and recycled water standpoint, the project doesn't have any bearing. Um, on it will charge them for, um, for what they use. Um, on the recycled water front, it does, um, it does take away a cost-effective opportunity to extend the existing purple pipe. So if we wanted to extend purple pipe um, to the other side of the development, that would be something that um, recycled water customers would need to bear. Um, that's not something on our radar today. It's sort of more of a long-term aspiration, so it's not taking away an in-process project by any means. Um, but the rate payers in the development, um, we do want to ensure that they're not overly burdened by higher rates because there's sort of this extra system in place. And so that's something that, um, as Nancy's articulated, we would work with the developer on. Okay, so, so do we think that with this approach, there's enough of a long-term cost savings that both the, the, the users of the system, so, so Google and any other you know, current future tenants, subtenants, et cetera, and San Jose ratepayers more broadly are all going to be better off financially in, in net? Um, so council member, there aren't cost savings to this. So um, if anything, this system would be more expensive to operate because okay. it sort of is additional. Um, but Google believes that there's environmental benefits um, to be had and they believe that they'll get some efficiencies out of it. One of the efficiencies they may be seeing is um, the cost to install um, and control the recycled water system. But, um, but it doesn't burden existing rate payers and it doesn't save existing rate payers. N Nancy, anything to add to that? I think the intention is, and, and there are Google folks on the phone, that um, it will provide the efficiencies and, and redundancies and uh, additional, uh, over time, better performance that we're all looking for, especially in light of climate change. Um, and for example, um, Google will be paying, as, as Carrie mentioned, 
our hookup fees for the recycled water, um, and it, it'll affect be a backup. For, so for, for the wastewater, wastewater. For, for the wastewater, thank you. Um, as mentioned, so that capacity will not be damaged uh, or diminished in any way. So um, there may well be cost savings to the participants within the system, and we just don't know the answer to that at this point. And, and I don't know if there's any additional comments that Cindy or Alexa or Paul would like to make. Yeah, happy to jump in. Um, I guess the two principal points have been um, covered. And one is that it's always environmentally superior to treat the waste closer to where the waste is happening in the sense of how that adds to the overall system. So it's not an either or, but the two systems together, as the SPUR report just also analyzed, is really creates a superior system in totality. So this is a great way forward and a great model for the future of how recycled water and the treatment of water can work in aggregate. So I think it's not, you know, I hate for it to be thought of as neither or. It's really about the, the aggregate of these systems is what creates more efficiency, better environmental outcomes, et cetera. And in terms of the rates, we will always it, the rates won't be higher for the users. So we're pretty expressive in the documentation that we can't charge higher rates than what somebody could get elsewhere outside the project. So I think from a rate payer perspective as well, within the project boundaries, um, there's only upside, not downside to it. Okay. I mean, I, I thank you. It's helpful. I mean, I'm just to be clear, I'm extremely excited about the potential sustainability benefits or environmental benefits here. I, I think that's wonderful. I, I think the only question, so this has been a little clarifying for me. So I didn't, I figured there were also cost savings kind of financially for Google, but in fact, it sounds like Google is willing to pay a premium for an innovative system that has significant sustainability benefits or environmental benefits. And I guess my only you know, thought process there was just wanting to ensure that there wasn't anything about that investment that would be shifting those pre that premium onto the broader system, essentially. And it doesn't sound like other San Jose ratepayers are anyway subsidizing that infrastructure that that build out. But I just want to be clear: is that is that correct? Am I hearing that correctly? That's correct, and that's okay. why we addressed rates very specifically to yeah. assure that across all the systems rate payers internal to the project wouldn't be bearing a higher rate than they would be paying elsewhere. And obviously there's no subsidy from the city uh, in, this, right. in all the systems. So there's no effect on external rate payers either. Okay, great. And then on the, on the energy front, Lori, is this, I mean, I assume any, any development in theory could, could do its own, incorporate some generation into its plan. So I just, is this a, is there any revenue impact that we should think about from an energy perspective? No, I, you know, in, in terms of the existing community energy program, um, no, I think I would say it's neutral to that um, and, and certainly supportive of maximizing, you know, the amount of onsite yep. generation within the development. Okay, great. And then ju just out of curiosity, what, what is the expected lifespan of this kind of system? How many, I, I'm sure it needs to be maintained and upgraded over time, but do we know much about how long this kind of investment is, is operational? Yeah, the system is expected like a building to go through the lifespan of the project. And so, um, and it'll get, you know, obviously iterated and innovative, innovated over time, which is part of the benefit of having the smaller grid system because as backup generation, other components mature, so too can the system fairly adapt. Great. So it's iterative, it improves over time. There's no end point to it from that perspective. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Davis. Thank you. And uh, like Council Member Mahan, I'm excited about the environmental benefits of um, this district system that I've learned a little bit about. Uh, and I appreciate, by the way, uh, having a <laughs> A briefing about this in advance so I could think more um, longer of, about these and have more questions that that have come up. I'm and I also have had uh, the Deardon area neighborhood group has also um, 
written in. And so I wanna make sure to ask their question as well. Um, but first, I, I wanna hear more, uh, Carrie, about the, the odor control mitigation plan. I understand that we are requiring it at the front end, but one of the things that you said, um, and it kind of went by quickly, but I wanna make sure we're really clear on this is that we don't have the ability to regulate that odor control over time. Is that what you said? The Bay Area Air Quality Management District would be regulating that over time. So that's something in the middle of the city. Um, I want you to say more about this. <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, you know, the, um, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District has jurisdiction over odors. Um, the city also has control in terms of public nuisance, et cetera. And I'll, I'll ask Rosalind to uh, talk more about the code enforcement and uh, PVC approach to uh, to public nuisances and how that would would be enforced. Um, so the city, but but the real heavy hand is the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. Um, however, you know the projects evolved over time. So it, at the start of the project, um, Google was or the developer was uh, contemplating uh, more on-site, so total on-site wastewater treatment. Um, they're not talking about that anymore. What they're talking about is more of a scalping plant where they're just taking off a little bit of water to, um, to produce a, a smaller amount of recycled water. So as the project has scaled down, our concerns about odors um, have lessened as well because in, um, in a version where they were going to do complete on-site wastewater treatment, where they were actually um, collecting the solids for disposition somewhere else, we obviously had, were concerned about that. Um, that's uh, that's changed over time, and and maybe Nancy, you can you can talk to that as well, and then Rosalind, if you could talk to how we would enforce odor uh, odor uh, nuisances. Rosalind, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Sure, thanks. Um, so certainly, we would treat um, you know this issue similarly to any nuisance or violation on private property. So if there are concerns from neighbors, from residents, they can file a complaint with our code enforcement division um, and our inspectors would open up a case and do an investigation. And, and obviously we would work uh, closely with BACMED um, as required as well. And then Alexa or team, perhaps you'll respond and give the examples of, of some um, other systems which are very neighborhood based. Yeah, certainly. Uh, the central utility plant, which is the area where the wastewater as well as other elements are, are treated or, or feeding from, is almost in many of the projects worldwide that Lendlease, our partner, has done and that we've seen elsewhere are, are effectively almost like learning centers. So you typically have a face to them outward to the community. They are a point of engagement. They're a point of, of starting to understand the systems, to learn about how climate action can work in real life. There's obviously incredible proximity to our office buildings. Um, so we're very confident that, you know, the way it's going to function is actually going to be a really positive thing to be next to. That being said, I think where people might um, be concerned about odor is usually when there's a longer transit run in between where the source of the odor is coming from, if you will, and where it's treated. So those shorter runs don't create that same issue you might have around a regional system. And so we're very confident then have seen live in action that there isn't um, any negative smells that are coming off of that central utility plant. And again, it is an area that is sort of iconic in the architecture of which is, is screened. It doesn't look like a um, power plant. Certainly it's the opposite. It looks very much like a placemaker. So um, happy to be ag and agreed that it always should be regulated around. Um, and so embrace that, but aren't, um, aren't concerned about it for that reason. I, I appreciate that. I do. I do want to um, caution staff, or I guess just put this. I would rather not have the only thing that we can do um, be the plan at the beginning and then enforcement at the end, as opposed to making sure that there's some compliance along the way. We, at least in my district, when we we we've, we've had an odor issue that is completely unrelated to to wastewater. Um, 
that has come up in the last year with a business and it has been it has been a nuisance for nearly a year now with this much smaller much smaller business and the code enforcement process I'm just putting that out there that I'm and I'm not saying that Google would need this process but I do want to be very um cognizant of the neighbor's needs and quality of life at the front end while we're thinking about this now, that the code enforcement process can be very long and neighbors can be um, inconvenienced to say the least for, for a long period of time. So I don't want that to be the only answer that we have in place, which is we, we will have a plan and then the backstop to the plan is code enforcement. If there's a problem, I'd rather have some way that we can ensure compliance so we don't get to that need for code enforcement, which is a very long process that is very, very inconveniencing to neighbors. And I've seen that in multiple, um, I've seen that in multiple ways in different parts of my district. So I, I feel really strongly about that. And, and I wanna make sure that that staff is, aware that I don't, I don't think that's sufficient. The, the answer of code enforcement is not a sufficient answer for me for that. Um, so I will be watching that uh, <laughs> as this unfolds for, for a more satisfactory way to handle that. Um, and then secondly, the, the Deardon area neighbor group had asked a question or, or I guess made, a, made an assertion in their letter about the ability for other developments that are in the DSAP area to um, to participate in the district you, the, the district system. So I'm wondering if there's um, if there's an answer either from staff or from Alexa about if as developments come online that are not Google owned but uh, that are in the DSAP, what's the process for bringing them? Um, bringing them into the district system? Will they be offered that? How does that, how does that work? Nancy, I don't know if you- yeah, I, I can start, Alexa, if you wanna go ahead, that there is the possibility uh, of being added. There isn't a specific process at this time, but the notion of other developers uh, funding um, links to the systems um, is something that has been or is being contemplated. Is there a timeline for when that will be worked out? I mean, I get that this is still a, a system in process, so, but I'm just wondering if that, if it's being, if the process for adding sort of non Google owned projects into the system is being developed at the same time as the system itself is being developed because of capacity issues or I guess I just want to know what what the possibilities are there. Great. Yeah, some go some ahead. of this depends on what type of system we go forward with. I mean, obviously the thermal system. I assume you're thinking of the microgrid in particular. Is that is that fair, Council Member? Because the thermal systems and so forth are are somewhat more internal to the building and the project level. So I think the well, I'll I'll tell you that um, you know. You know, Alexa, that this uh, utility corridor, the utilidor concept is very new to me. So I don't have a specific um, part of the utilities that I was thinking of. And, and really, this is a question that I'm passing through uh, from the Deardon Area Neighborhood Group. So I don't, I don't have one, you know, set on which utility. Yeah, so on the microgrid in particular, obviously one of the strong advantages of a municipal system or PG&E system is its ability to, to, to work from it and move beyond it. I think if it's a private system, there would be a variety of, of things we would have to consider around whether that made us sort of a regulated utility versus providing the system within the project itself, which would include all the an availability for all the different types of projects within us like the affordable housing parcels and so forth but it somewhat depends on what route is taken um, which of course as you know is related a little bit to the timing of the project and when we move forward with the project relative to the timing of the city's decision around a municipal system or pg and es decision around a pg and &E system so it's somewhat dependent on some of those routes and a little hard to answer more directly but certainly as Google, we would be more than open 
um, obviously you can see a big determination of ours is to create um, climate resilience. And so to the extent that infrastructure can be extended in a way that's feasible, we would um, be more than open to collaborating on how best to do that. Thank you. And then Carrie, this kind of, um, in terms of the, the response you gave to council member Mahan, you had talked about something about, and, and maybe I'm mischaracterizing this, but the note I wrote is it, uh, this takes away the possibility for, for extending purple pipe past the system. Maybe I misunderstood that. And I want to be, I want you to talk a little bit more about that because I think it relates to this issue. Yeah. Thank you. Um, if I misspoke, it doesn't take away any, any future option to kind of go around the site and, um, and to other locations. It just takes away the, um, the opportunity to do it now with someone else funding it. Um, so ideally we, you know, we would like to have um, recycled water at more parks, more schools, et cetera, more of the big users throughout the city. And so um, if the development, instead of um, making its own recycled water, um, it just uh, tapped into our system, that would enable us to more quickly and more um, cost effectively extend the purple pipe to other regions. But um, that's not a project that we have on our radar to do anytime soon. So it's not like we're pushing aside an opportunity that we're, we're ready to do. Okay, so do I understand then correctly from what you're saying that we, the, the Google um, recycled water will be self-contained and won't be connected to our purple pipe at all? Yes, it will not be connected to our purple pipe. Um, we have responsibility uh, under State Department of Health and our wastewater permit um, that we cannot connect other systems to ours. Um, the system that will be constructed for this development will only service that development. Okay, and so other, I guess Alexa then that begs the question for me about whether other developments in the DSAP area would, for the recycled water, would connect to your system or would need to be connected to the city purple pipe system. And yeah. Yeah, so I think the reason we're not connected to the purple pipe system is because we're creating a system that allows for more efficient treatment of the water closer to the site, which obviously has tremendous environmental benefits. Um, we, I'm not sure, you know, I don't know, Cindy, if you wanna pipe in here, but if, as we start to extend our system, I'm not sure that that is the way we had envisioned it. It's not that we wouldn't be open to exploring it. We just hadn't envisioned it that way. Um, but to the extent that the city at some point said, you know, this is much better to connect into your system versus to try to extend it. As I said, we'd be more than open to discuss that. It just hasn't been explored at this time. So would individual developments um, carry, have that, Option they to, they, to they would not. Okay. No, council member. There, um, the other uh, other facilities will be served by South Bay Water Recycling, um, most likely through um, San Jose Water. But um, but we would not allow others to um, to sort of uh, take over our service area. Um, the system we have is, is very efficient, and um, you know, still we have capacity. If um, if the development would just like to use the existing system that is available, um, but um, but yeah, we wouldn't allow others to tap into it. What's the closest purple pipe to the DSAP now? I will get back to you on that. No problem. I, <laughs> I don't have a map with me, but I I'll didn't get know it. I had that question before yes. I asked it. So yeah, it's okay. not incredibly far. But you yeah, know, purple I, pipe is expensive. Well, Cahill is you know Cahill Park is nearby, and um, and Del Monte Park is nearby, and I don't know if either of them have it so that's those were that was why I was asking if they, if they did or not um and then one of the utilities that we didn't hear about and I, I'm sure this is just a quick answer but the garbage and recycling will that be from like normal commercial haulers just as any other business and residences yes yeah, so and and Bill if you want to add context um 
you know, there's been a lot of different environmental and sustainability considerations in the project. And um, there was um, the idea to do a standalone system. Um, where we are now is the, uh, the development will tap and use the commercial and residential system, which is a, a leading performer in the, in the country. And so, you know, we'd like to believe that their intent to be a, a, a sustainability leader led them to say, hey, you guys already have a great system that's very efficient um, and uh, performing at high levels of diversion. Uh, you know, why not just take advantage of that? And that would be the same for street sweeping too, I assume. I know nothing about street sweeping. Bill, how do you feel about street sweeping? That falls to somebody else. I'm sorry on that <laughs> one, Gary. I, um, most of a lot of the streets are private streets um, within the development, so they would likely be handled by the by the property owners rather than by the city. And the, the last point to carry on the councilor on the um, the the, re, the garbage and recycling is that um, it's it's one of the uh, <clears throat> topics that was evaluated in the in the downtown west environmental documents. So they studied how it would work and what the impacts would be. But at this point in time, <clears throat> we're just, they've decided not to necessarily pursue that. There's a, a whole host of complications with dealing with the existing operators and the, and the issues surrounding that that makes it easier to move forward with that as a future option rather than something that you try to take on immediately today. So that's why we they've dropped that from the, this initial proposal for utilities. Well, and I just wanna emphasize there are opportunities perhaps to consider in the future. And, but those, the recognition is that that consideration would come back to council. Okay, so it's not going to come in the, on the Google day. It'll be some time no. later. Not it's Super Tuesday, later. right, yeah. And council member, the closest recycled water is at the northern boundary of the project um, at that by that target on Coleman. Okay, so it's pretty close. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, thank you for answering all my questions. It's a it's it's a big project and there's a lot of a lot of pieces and even just within um, even just within the district system, I'm still trying to get all all my um, my arms get my arms around all of it. So I, I really appreciate you all taking the, the time to do this study session for us today and to answer all my questions. And as as I said before, I'm, I'm excited about the, the environmental benefits and just um, really wanna make sure that we we enhance the quality of life for our residents as we, as we are designing these new systems. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Perales. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you as well for the, the presentation uh, and I will say thank you too, uh, just like my colleagues for the, the briefing ahead of time. This is a complicated topic and certainly it's, it's new to uh, most people here uh, and so it's certainly new to, to me. Uh, so that, that uh, was, a, was a benefit to have a, a deeper dive one-on-one um, -on -one ahead of time. Um, and I want to say thank you to uh, Councilmember Davis for bringing up the Deer Down Area Neighborhood Group letter um, and was uh, gonna mention the same uh, question uh, or at least what they insinuated in there is a question in regards to wanting to, to see if there's a partnership. Um, they, they also expressed interest, just kind of noting that. I think that is positive to see that our local neighborhoods, um, the representatives, at least for the, these neighborhoods through the, the DANG, uh, have shown support for this effort. Um, I think that's important to be able to, to know what our, our local community is thinking uh, albeit still new to, to them as well. Um, so a couple questions. Uh, I wanted to see, and this is leading off of what Councilmember Davis was saying around tapping in. Um, is it possible, for instance, if it was privately owned, and I understand the, the challenges there, um, where maybe not as so easy, uh, sound like there could be a possibility, but maybe not so easy for a local neighborhood that's pre-existing to tap in. Um, would it be possible though that in emergency situations um, as, as this power source could could then be uh, obviously self-sustaining, could it also then help to be an emergency backup source for the greater community in the area as well? Um, and what would the capacity be for, for, for something like that? And the possibility. 
Council member, I'll, I'll start, and uh, I suspect I'll lean, the rep, Alexa and her group can weigh in as well. But this, thus far, what we're being, we understand is that the site, the projects within the site could, would generate up to about 20% of the electrical uh, demand that it takes to run the overall district. And so there's not like a surplus of power being generated that would then even be available to distribute outside. There's enough power to operate the emergency needs that they would have within their development projects. Uh, I would say also just to add to that bill, there, it depends on which roads taken. So if the council determines that a municipal system is appropriate and you adopt that, then there's a way to think through that. It's harder to do, obviously, um, if, you know, if it's more if it's different options. So it really depends on the option that we go down. It's a little bit hard, again, to kind of get control of an isolation. But I think there's lots of opportunity to also think of are there ground fire, um, whether it's libraries or community uses that can serve as, you know, a resilient part of the overall social infrastructure of the area. But um, that would just be our additions to the conversation. The, the only other thing I wanted to add for a second is that it you know, it's very positive to have this level of infrastructure and systems thinking going forward. There are others who are seeing what this project is considering doing, like West Bank. Um, some of you may know West Bank owns and operates a uh, power grid itself in Canada. And so it's encouraging to see what other um, uh, extensions of investment in infrastructure and resiliency um, they can build off Google's model, meaning not off the necessary project, but what can they extend? So it's it's having a, a knock-on effect in a very positive way. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and, and appreciate that, Alex, on, you know, the thought process around could there be critical infrastructure that could be included, for instance, if there was a public building there, a community center or some sort, right? That um, fire station or something like that. Traditionally, right now, right, we're we're running all of our our backup with uh, generators on these sites, and so. Um, but but understanding what Bill said, that the the sort of power capacity there, the twenty percent there, uh, certainly not not enough to just go around and be able to spread out. It's really uh, based on on some some base level services to keep uh, a building going. Um, could somebody describe uh, in the presentation and in, in the uh, PowerPoint slide and stuff like that, it, it was very informational in regards to the options in front of us um, and, and the three potential Did you guys lose me for a second there? Yes, you froze for just a second. Okay, because my screen went away and then came back. Uh, where did I? <laughs> No if we just get really good Wi-Fi in this district, that would be helpful. <laughs> where, where did I where did I jump off? Anyway, right at the beginning. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, so uh, what I was saying was that uh, in the presentation, uh, you described sort of the the opportunities in front of us, the micro grid options, for instance, San Jose owned, pg e owned, Google owned, um, but what what wasn't part of that presentation was um, status quo. So kind of what if none of these options, right? You alluded to it in the responses, uh, each individual, and I think Carrie maybe the most in regards to just, you know, hey, we can, you know, this, this can be done without any of these options really, right? Just kind of plug into the system that currently exists. So if someone could kind of describe that to me um, of, of what does that status quo look like if this wasn't being considered by Google um, and we understand here from Councilor Mahan's questions that maybe it's not even necessarily uh, at least up front not a cost savings to them right there's, there's other implications which are a benefit to us in regards to the environmental implications and and to them and, and sort of just being good stewards in regards to this kind of a development um, but I guess what I would like to see would be one, a description now, but two, is there a comparative kind of, hey, well, here's the options, but here's also status quo. And, and that way we get a clear understanding of, of why maybe this is better than status quo. That's, that's the understanding I have based on the conversations, right? Uh, and the, the more in depth dialogue I've been able to have. But I think that's important to, to have that 
uh, clear to our community that that um, you know what a status quo look like, and that somehow uh, there shouldn't be a belief that status quo is is just fine, right? Let's just let's just keep going down that route. So. Hey, Council Member, I, I could start, and I'm sure Alexa, you might want to jump in, and Nancy. Um, so the status quo would be PG&E retail service. So that's what most development take. Um, I would say some of the, the constraints that would come along with that is uh, less flexibility in terms of maximizing the amount of on-site resources. So certainly some of the central plant, the on-site solar battery storage, other types of distributed energy resources that Google is proposing would be limited and constrained under that uh, scenario just due to certain you know, current design standards and CPUC regulations. So that's really, I, I think, one of the main benefits of looking at alternatives is, you know, collaborating with Google to find ways to really maximize that, that on-site generation to provide those resiliency benefits. And so that really was the genesis of why the city started to, to work with Google and, and why we've started to look at the initial feasibility of um, a, a city option just for this development is really to enable some of that um, secondary, I would say um, <clears throat> the status quo would also be PG&E's rates. Um, so there may also be some economic benefits uh, from the other options in terms of rate savings. It's important to note on, on the city option that Prop 218 would apply there. So if there were rate savings, those would be passed on in, in cost of service rates to the development, and we would be legally required to do that just as we are for other utilities. So, um, so yeah, I, I'm sure others uh, may want to jump in here, but, but those are, that would be the status quo option is, is PG&E electric service. Alexa, do you want to add to that? I think that was perfectly described, frankly. Um, obviously, the microgrid's intention is to not draw from existing infrastructure that's already very constrained and is, is obviously, um, as, as electricity needs expand, it becomes more challenging for that piece of infrastructure. And so this is intended to, in a more clean and therefore, you know, I think the equivalent is about a 30, 3,400 cars coming off the road in terms of volume of solar it's producing, but we're able to then lower the burden on the overall infrastructure, which ultimately obviously lowers costs of what is already a system that is um, struggling. So um, that seems like a very fair way to articulate that. Each of the different systems have obviously different upsides, but the philosophy always holds where when you're able to treat it off the system and have the aggregate of off the system and on the system, you're reducing um, your, your draw and your load for the overall system. So it's only creating more efficiency and more ability for that system to adapt and expand to other projects outside of us. So it's really reducing the burden and treating all the different systems in a way that is cleaner and that is uh, more forward thinking on how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and other important um, elements of how climate change is, is evolving around us. Thank you. And, and Carrie, uh, you did a good job already, I think, kind of describing that this could just plug into our, our current system, uh, the infrastructure that's there. So I'll ask you a couple more maybe specific questions in regards to that. So, for instance, for, for wastewater treatment, um, would this be wastewater that would run into sort of the piping that's into downtown and then kind of going uh, north towards Alviso? Yes, so the, it would share the collection system. Um, anytime, and Matt can add into this, anytime there's, you know, a significant development, uh, the public works team looks at the capacity of the collection system um, to see if you know they want to run new pipes, expand the existing ones, or if the existing capacity is adequate. So yeah, it would, it would in some way, whether whether the existing pipes or a new set of pipes feed its way into uh, the wastewater facility. And and is that going to have to happen anyways? It sounded like you said that Google's going to be skimming some of the water off the top, right? So they'll be yes. they'll be recycling some, but they're still going to have to dump into our wastewater system. 
Yes, they'll still be connecting to us. And most operations, even if they do full on-site wastewater treatment, they connect into the existing infrastructure just in case something goes wrong with their system and they need the, um, that waste to leave their facility. They need uh, the capacity to at, at our wastewater facility or, or any, any facility that does on-site wastewater. Similar to how a, um, a high user of recycled water, um, a data center or something, they, you know, 100% of the time they're going to use recycled water, but on the off chance that system goes down, they connect to potable just as a backup. Okay. Um, if I, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I just want to clarify something so that you were clear, council member. We are paying wastewater hookup fees like we don't have a system. So in other words, we are paying for that um, capacity in a backup situation as a normal user would. So I don't want you to, to feel that we're, you know, asking for the backup system, but not, not generating that payment. So that should create some capacity because hopefully we'll never have to use it. Well, we do have to reserve the capacity for you. So, so it does, um, it does take capacity from the system because when you send it to us, we have to be able to treat it. But, um, but we have more than enough capacity for the build out for the future of the city. So it's not constrained. So we're not worried about and and I'm trying to get an understanding, uh, and this is on the long lines of the odor as well, because I know we've we've had this challenge um, throughout the downtown core where um, there are uh, particular points where um, the the water circulates uh, and then and then emits a pretty pretty nasty odor, um, and obviously the increase in sewage water as it goes through these pipes. This has been actually a recurring question that a lot of uh, constituents in District Three have asked me: "Is say, hey, when you know, like this deer on West gets uh, uh, or, or downtown West gets built out, um, what is that going to do with some of the increase of the odors that we're that we're experiencing in the downtown core?" So my question and curiosity is: Would this help with Google having their own sort of skimming off some of the water, right? And, and being able to, to manage and, and recycle some of the water there on site, as they were saying, um, would that help then? Because again, it's reducing some of the flow and in, in, in the capacity and, and overall, could that, you know, uh, lessen maybe the, the, the impact of, of the odor throughout the downtown? Um, Council member, I don't think this project is going to, if we have existing, um, challenges in the collection system. I don't think this, this project's gonna improve that, but I don't think, it, I, I don't think it's gonna make it any worse. And, um, you know, the less liquid in the system means that there's more solids, which means at, at some point there can't be not enough liquid or the solids don't move. Um, but I know, and, and I'll uh, hand it over to Matt. I know Matt and Public Works are looking at the collection system and that's all pro part of scoping out the project, getting the details for, you know, how much are we talking about when and working collaboratively with the developer? And before Matt jumps in, I'll, I'll be a little more specific. I, I didn't expect this to improve it, but I guess what, what I wanted to compare would be um, if, if they did not have their own water treatment on site at all and 100% and sent their water down our, our pipes versus what they're proposing to have on site. Those two comparisons would, would one of them, you know, because it increases flow, is it right to be, uh, you know, to, to relate that to the fact that that could worsen the uh, the odors? So Matt, since that's a kind of a collection system thing, I'll, I'll let you take that. Yeah, thanks, um, Member. And I don't have the uh, a perfect answer to that right now. I think we're, we'll 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 need to follow up a little bit. But we are, as you know, working on the um, working our way south um, on the force the major interceptor to finish that, and we still have. Um, uh, final phase of that to fund and build in the future um, uh, to and, and so um, to get it all the way down to um, through the center of downtown where we need it. So um, we'll follow up on that. I, I can't off the top of my head can't think of any reason why it would make it better or worse. Um, I think um, and so we haven't that hasn't come up and so we'll follow up um, with more detail that as we move forward. Okay. Yeah, that's part of, and the reason I'm asking again is part of what I'd like to see and something that I can visually share with my constituents is a comparison, right? That just sort of says, hey, here, you know, the status quo would be plugging into all the pre-existing systems from PG&E for electricity to our water treatment, right? And, and completely just plugging in there, 
versus what they're proposing with some water treatment on site, uh, right? Their their own cogen facility, and so and, and and be able to just see what what are those you know, what are the impacts, what are the benefits, um, you know, and why would we uh, why would we consider one over these the other? Uh, Carrie, your 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 dog just uh, totally made me lose my my track of thought. <laughs> Sorry. Such a cute little dog just moved in the background. And, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> took me took me off uh, there. So um, this is the fun part about zooming from from home here. Um, so okay, uh, th and this also this next question ties into the comparison chart as well. And this I wasn't aware of until today's conversation of the purple pipe issue. And I saw Councilmember Davis's. Uh, you know, eyes perk up too when, when I think when she heard that, especially considering that, you know, I think the concern could be that, hey, is there a bigger challenge for um, the, you know, the residents just on the other side of Deardon, um, which are all her constituency. And so um, it, it sounds as though, you know, we're going to be in there, there's going to be a lot of construction going on, and it sounds as though we're not going to be able to, while the, while the you know, roads are torn up, to be installing new purple pipe, which maybe if, if they were just plugging into our system, that would be an opportunity. Is that is that correct, Karen? Um, it, it, it is because we don't have extending the purple pipe on our roadmap to do today. But um, but the way I might suggest we think about it is um, you know, we weren't looking to add purple pipe to this particular development. And um, and they've stepped up and said, hey, we absolutely want it in the system. And so, you know, rather than just tapping into our, our potable water, which, you know, we know is becoming more scarce, they're sort of saying, hey, we want to, you know, from day one, we want to use the right water for the right application. And then what does it look like for, um, right, we, are we safe to assume this, this recycled water on site can be utilized um, like we would have wanted to in the the parks, the open space, right? Um, the the areas obviously that are all being proposed to be built out here. Um, I'm assuming that's the, the thought process, and I'll kick that over to Alexa. Yeah, the intention of the amount of recycled water that we're using, we're treating, and that we're using throughout the district is that we disinfect and treat it and then utilize it for elements like the open space, et cetera. And so, so that is very much the intention. Okay. Um, yeah, th that's the, actually the end of my questions. Um, I would like to hear back maybe just from the city manager's office. Um, uh, so maybe Nancy over to you to just, what does it look like to be able to get us something like a comparison of, of sort of the, the status quo versus what is being proposed in, in total here. We'll have to do a little bit of research on that. Thank you very much for the, count, the question, council member. I, I, I think one of the opportunities here is that um, the system that is being proposed by Google and Downtown West offers an opportunity uh, that as Alexa mentioned, the program, the, the costs will not be allowed to be more than what is uh, uh, in the marketplace, and, and it may be less. It will also allow um, ways for us to look very close up. Are there ways we could uh, proceed bringing costs down? For example, right now, purple pipe is not inexpensive. So is there is there any other district systems that in the future can also find a different way as we evolve legislation, as we as evolve process. Um, because anytime you cut into the street, as you know, and lay lay pipe, um, there's a lot of hassle and a lot of cost. So, so aside from the environmental benefits, um, but looking at are there different ways to do things that can help us evolve? And yeah, we'll guess... go back to looking at the cost and comparison. I guess, Nancy, just to kind of, so I think we understand that, that what's being requested though, in terms of, you know, establishing a, a matrix that kind of compares kind of what's, what we're contemplating here and the options that are kind of built into it and, and kind of what, as the council member said, what kind of the standard operating procedure or standard kind of approach to development. I think we understand what's being requested and I think we can put some work into that to kind of help, help the council and the public understand 
kind of where the trade-offs are and the differences are and, and, and where the opportunities are. And, and look, I think the information is all there because uh, I've been asking, you know, whether we're in the one-on-one -on -one meetings or here and the, the trade-offs and benefits around uh, environmental impacts, right? Reducing, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, the, the water we're talking about here, the water treatment, uh, the, the potential, you know, cost savings, the dollar amount, right? And Nancy's talking about right here, but where it's not, it's, it's not in sort of a, a, a clear, you know, fashion of where I, where I can go out and and really be able to explain it to the community um and here, here is here's kind of status quo and here's some of the uh the benefits of uh of this alternative option that, that we haven't explored before in the city because it is you know up here, I think for a lot of people um that's the biggest concern right or or challenge is simply the fact that we just haven't done this and so um you know i think to be able to to describe what we you know what's what a standard operating procedure versus this could be helpful. Fortunately, as you've seen, again, that Deer Down Area neighborhood group, so the, the community members around there are supportive. I, I don't think there's, you know, this this uh, growing opposition to it, but certainly it will help, right? As we move forward, we're trying to get people to understand it, including ourselves, right? Again, as council members, because this this is um, this is a, a, a complicated area. So that's it for my comments and questions. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, appreciate all the. The work that's gone into this and all the information you provided today. Uh, I just had a few questions I want to follow up with. My apologies for not providing video, uh, but I'm in a place with very limited Wi Fi, and I'm hoping that maybe you guys will put Wi Fi at the top of the list of what gets built out with this infrastructure. Um, I had a question about water because I know that the project itself is probably going to result in the pumping of a lot of water, I'm assuming because we're going to be doing a lot of stuff underground. And I assume, and I guess the question is, is all that water that we'd be pumping just for the development, is that all going to get sort of treated and addressed on site somehow, or is that all getting shipped up to a water treatment plant? Bill, you want to, you want to answer that? Well, I don't, I, hate to step into building this project for Alexa right out of the blocks. So uh, would you like Cindy can respond to it? If I think like Cindy's so. probably sure. close yeah. to how the construction is going to go. Can, yep. Hi. Uh, yeah. So for, for the water, um, because of the, because we'll be doing the on-site treatment, it's probably an in-between answer, uh, Mayor. It's uh, because we'll be doing the on-site treatment, we'll actually be reducing our demand from the potable water system. Because what, what happens is we will be treating a fair amount of our, our well, we'll be treating all of our own waste and extracting the recycled water to offset potable water needs. And we'll do that by using that extracted, that recycled water for things like toilet flushing, uh, for, to make up water in the cooling uh, water system, basically using as much of it as we can smartly in the project before discharging it. So that by its nature reduces the overall load. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and, and I assume there would need to be permanent pumps uh, in place for whatever gets built. Is that right, Alexa? The, there will, um, well, as much as possible, we, we try to rely, we try to design smartly so that we can uh, reduce pumping needs because that also is an efficiency in the system. But where needed, there will be equipment that will like pumps that will to move the water around. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Cindy. Um, then I just had a couple questions about the generation on site for electrical demand. Now, Bill had pointed out, I think earlier, maybe it was Bill told me off another time, but it was, it was stated that about 20% of the needs would be satisfied on site. And do you have any sense at this point? I know you don't have a lot of room on this site for a big solar field or anything like that. Um, what what is it going to be solar is the mode for generation? Or are you thinking fuel cells or um, at this at this at this point in time, the project is primarily focused on solar PV um, with a combination of battery storage to help with the uh, the peaks and valleys in a, in a day of uh, using electricity. Um, but the 
the great aspect of the in pu putting this microgrid solution is that we'll have an opportunity to innovate and adapt and adjust as we have technologies come available that make sense for the for the for the footprint of our project. And I appreciate that at least the current estimate is only 20%. Um, as we're working through this, is it possible for us to try to transparently understand what it would cost to get that percentage higher? And I guess the reason why I'm asking is, you know, we've been grappling with this for two years, I think, as a city, trying to figure out how we can build microgrids that provide some resilience and, you know, through distributed generation and storage in our city. And, and we, you know, we've struggled, I think, like a lot of cities. We know it's costly when it's really hard. Um, and it seems to me if we've got a significant investment happening here, it may be easier than making it happen elsewhere. And so I'm just wondering, is that is that something where we could have an iterative conversation about, well, we can only do 20, but if the city meets us halfway, we could do 60 or whatever. I think it's a it's a good idea. We absolutely can continue to have um, uh, conversations about as we learn. I mean, we we learn about projects in our other locations as well, where we're testing different ideas for power generation with mostly with solar, but other ideas as well. Um, and absolutely, would be interested in continuing to improve the the generation that we can do on site. That is our definitely our goal to generate our electricity as close as possible to where we're we're using it. And also uh, the other side of this equation, of course, is in uh, working with the demand of electricity. And so anything we can do through, in, in, you know, thinking about our approach to managing the demand, we can work on that together as well. That would help reduce the need for electricity. Thanks, Cindy. I, I'd really look forward to that because I, I know that you guys, I'm sure, is, are as worried about resilience as we are. I, I don't have a lot of confidence that pg and &E is gonna fix the grid problems anytime in the next couple of years. Uh, and I think a lot of cities are figuring out they need to find a way to go it alone. So it, I'd really like to dig in on this problem with, with a great team over at Google. Uh, and I know we're also piling in other projects and other places. You know, we're looking at all kinds of ideas around uh, clean hydrogen for fuel cells and things like that. And it, it would just be great to see if, if there are other options that we could incorporate here to boost the resilience of this microgrid as well as uh, perhaps improve the situation for the surrounding community. Um, anyway, thank you, Cindy, for your, your answers. I, I know that uh, ongoing challenge has been with PG&E in trying to get through the permits and approvals for these systems. Uh, I recall Apple just having a brutal time on their site, uh, and I think it delayed the project quite a bit. I'm just wondering, is, is there any way that we can sort of start that process in parallel with everything else we're doing? So we can get in line. <laughs> uh, that's uh, it, it's definitely good to acknowledge that there are processes we need to follow to get these connections in place. And absolutely, we've actually already engaged um, PG&E uh, quite there. We're quite actively talking with them um, about all the pieces of the, of the that they would need to contribute to this project. Um, and definitely we're in the queue uh, in terms of the application being in the system so that we can that we can be ready when we need to be for this project. That's great. Um, and I, I recall there's a relocation of a substation down there. Um, I think just to the south of the train station. Does that get integrated in some way with the district utility or does that get moved somewhere else? Uh, no, actually, it's a bit of a, there's a whole a few different parts around the electrical substation pieces that would be needed for this project, but the, the substation that exists today is not part, uh, we would not be moving it as part of our project. Um, we in fact will be doing a, um, additional substation equipment for our own needs for the project. Okay, so, so that gets relocated to some other site? I'm not aware of the plans for the, that substation A. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Mayor, it probably gets more affected when the as the rail project moves forward. It's uh, as, Cindy, as Cindy notes, this their project um, taps off of that but moves into a, their own central plant for the for their substation. Yeah, appreciate that's a lot of a lot of big construction projects to manage at once. So, so thanks, Bill, and also great to see uh, 
Bill Eckern back uh, working with the city in partnership uh, back from retirement as well as Kevin O'Connor. Welcome back to two gentlemen. I know you've been working with us for a while, but uh, with COVID, uh, we never actually get to see anybody. So good to see you all. Uh, really grateful for this team uh, working together to make this happen. I think it's going to be really important for the future of our city and hopefully a great model platform for us to be able to demonstrate what we can do elsewhere in the city and elsewhere in the country. So uh, thanks for all the great work. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, I guess then we'll plug ahead. Uh, we'll be discussing this again in a few weeks uh, as we discuss the entire project. Uh, Dave, do you have any closing comments before we adjourn or go to uh, public comment? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, no, I just wanna thank the entire team. I know a tremendous amount of work has gone into this so far um, and it's complicated work, um, but very interesting work. And so uh, thank you to the team for everything you've done kind of getting us up to this point. And Nancy, you have any final comments? No, Dave, thank you very much. And thank you to everybody on the team. All right, thank you. I, I don't believe there's public comment after a study session, which we've already had public comment on the study session. Is that right, Nora? <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure I don't break any rules. Yes. Okay, so we, we've had the public comment. Okay, well, thanks everybody, the means adjourned. Thank you.